This is Luke Bohanaki here with another episode at the First Customer Club. And today, I'm joined by John Corrigan, co-founder and CEO at Summit Sync. Essentially, Tinder meets business conferences. Am I actually allowed to say that? John has secured over half a billion dollars in sales for Fortune 500 brands, was doing at least five to ten million dollars a month in reoccurring revenue with Summit Sync, and recently announced they were acquired by Cvent to top the success story off. Now, I had a chance to meet John and his business partners Al and Justin at a business conference in Barcelona, Spain, out of all places. Thanks to MK Marsden for that awesome introduction. And I was able to convince John and his pals to actually be guinea pigs and customer champions for my then software product venture. So I had an interesting perspective behind the scenes how Summit Sync was able to pivot their way to startup scale. John is just one of those guys that I would encourage any entrepreneur at any particular stage to listen to what he has to say, jot it down, and give it a try. This episode will dive specifically into John's story building Summit Sync from the idea stage on up, what a startup needs, and who a startup needs to be successful, the mindset and some tactics for enterprise sales and startups, and how to fail faster and pivot as basically a set of instructions. I'd say something like, I hope you enjoy this episode. But if you don't, you're an idiot. Lights, camera, traction. Obviously, we're going to tell the story, basically, how you build a company that was making tens of millions of dollars, you know, selling enterprise software that make, you know, the basically engineer handshakes, as I think you guys like to say, right? Yeah, we like to say we engineer handshakes and we automated your in-person meetings. Um, and so, you know, that's, and listen, I, I would say... Um, I was very fortunate to lead a team of people who were very dedicated, uh, very, very smart. And, uh, you know, while actually my co-founder had the idea, um, and, uh, the, uh, we had, we kind of, the idea started in one place and morphed to another over five and a half years. And, uh, I was just lucky to work with a group of people who were very, who were much smarter than me and hold on for dear life. So, well, I, I, I hear you. So before it felt like holding on for dear life at that early stage, you had one of the greatest perhaps assets going into the business in Al Torres, right? You guys had been yeah. through the ringer together before. Like how important is that when you're doing a startup? How much of a difference do you think that made that before you started Summit Sync, you had somebody that you not only trusted, but was like a true real friend of yours in order to jump into the trenches. I know you joined forces with Justin as well, but like how important are those relationships do you think for the startup? Yeah, I think, you know, Al and I had worked together previously and so, and we'd worked in different capacities. Um, so we, we knew each other and we were friends. Like we would hang out outside of work. Right. And, right. um, I knew his fiance at the time who was now his wife. Um, and, so I, I knew him, I, I, and I trusted him in a professional and personal capacity. Uh, and we were very, and we're, I think he's like a couple months. So he's, his birthday's March, mine's September. So we're contemporaries in terms of age. Um, we have similar outlooks on life. We do disagree on, on certain things, but uh, I think that's a positive thing. Um, and over the course of, you know, seven plus years of, of knowing each other. I think we've both worked on our relationship a lot and, and we've talked about how we communicate with one another and we've definitely had our blow ups, um, how we communicate with one another, what each other needs to support the other. It's, it's my longest and, and I, and I would argue my most valuable relationship and, and uh, actually one of the really hard parts about COVID is I haven't seen him since, um, I think early March or, or late February. And I, 
called him up at one point. And I was like, I don't even sound like a total weirdo, but I, 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 I kind of miss you, dude. Like I, you know, we have our routines like, um, yeah. And so, yeah, I mean, and we, we chat every day and, and we're still working together. Uh, but it's, it's weird. Like, you know, you go through this, this period of time where you see the the people that you love and get to work with and admire every day. And then you're all of a sudden, it's like, it's like graduating college. You're like, oh, I don't get to see those people every day. I guess so. And COVID just amplifies that. Um, yeah, completely. And I think it's isolating for a lot of folks. Agreed. So Al came to you with the idea and, you know, walk me through what he said, because it seems like problem identification seems like one of the biggest things in entrepreneurship. Did Al come to you? and say, hey, there is $600 billion spent on conferences and trade shows in the U.S., and people are doing this stuff wrong, and it's corporate tourism. And no, it wasn't, it wasn't like that. It was, um, we were, one, we had talked about starting a company together, and we were ruminating on ideas every week, and we were, we kind of started with like three ideas that we, we believed in that we, we thought could be businesses. Um, one, didn't get off the ground. One made some money and we shut it down at, at some point. And then Summit Sync obviously got going. But he came to the idea, us, me with the idea, or we were ch chatting, so we were collaborating about, hey, what about the idea of Tinder meets business conferences? And I was like, great. Well, I was, and we were going to business conferences a lot. We we're going to business conferences twice a month. So we were thinking about, all right, well, what are the problems? We're experiencing this problem firsthand ourselves. And then we kind of saw it together and then we started to dig into the research and we found a lot of research that had done, been done by PricewaterhouseCooper around the total addressable market. So if, if you think about the kind of the four elements of what you need to start a business, it's you know a, a total addressable market uh, that's large, um, an individual problem that can be solved by product and technology, uh, you need a great team and then you need the ability to market and sell it. Um, and so, you know, kind of putting those four elements together around the TAM and problem set was, uh, was where we started. Yeah. That, uh, I hear you there. You guys came from a background in enterprise sales. You specifically, you know, you had worked it with AOL, you worked with Groupon, you worked with EDO interactive, you know, you worked at te uh, te telemetry, um, and that's at, at telemetry. Te telemetry. Why am I saying that the wrong way? Tele Can you say this is ridiculous. Telemetry. Yep. Holy smokes! I'm not going to edit that out. I want people to understand how stupid I am. Anyways, you guys met at telemetry. You and Al. Um, you came from a plethora of enterprise sales. When you were thinking about where you wanted to start, John, were you looking at it like? I want to find a B2B kind of problem. Were you looking at it in terms of let's find something where I can apply my enterprise sales skills? Like, was that? No, a it was, it was like, we, we came at it and we've learned this now, but at the time we, we didn't know our elbow from our ass was we came at the, the initial problem as from a consumer standpoint. So, um, how you get individuals to download and sign up for summit sync. Right. And, and really, understanding and pushing on that um and that was a skill set that we had to develop over time and 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 i would say yeah we so we learned that we learned it the hard way um and it, you know you realize you're not going to reinvent most of these things you're you're very rarely going to reinvent um so no we didn't start out as you know we spent almost two years on the consumer business and the enterprise businesses, when you, when you find, like what you'll find is there's very rarely a single decision maker in a, in an enterprise sale. It's a, it's about building consensus and about understanding solution selling and stakeholders and um, who has input on who and, and who has influence in the organization, who's the check writer, who's the influencer. Um, because most enterprise decisions, purchase decisions are made by group consensus which right. in some cases doesn't work very, very well. Um, especially if you don't have a, de a design or a, a process. Um, but, and it's a psychology equation too. And it's, it's fun. 
Um, so I, we have a deep background in enterprise sales and building enterprise sales process and go to market strategy, um, which when we pivoted from a consumer business to an enterprise business, you know, was explosive in terms of its growth. Um, and so, uh, that worked out really, really well, but the journey was a very circuitous one, a circuitous one and one that was just as, as most startups will find, it's a series of failures and you just kind of fail your, you either fail your way into going out of business or you fail your way into uh, scaling a business. And we were fortunate enough to have yeah, failed our way and, and had investors who were supportive of failing our way into a, into a business and, and failing and, you know, you only fix things if you fail at them. And so, um, I would say if, if the, if I was going to do anything different, it'd be, um, failing faster and spending more time on the hiring process, like getting people onto the team, um, were the two things that I would, I would probably have done faster, like, um, failed, failed at initiatives faster and hired and fired faster. Yeah. Did this, uh, about failing faster, you mean just experiment more, right? Just try more things, just execute on different ideas faster, just throw. Yeah, I would say, no, it's less, less executing on ideas faster. It's like setting a, Hey, this is what we're going to try. This is why we're going to try it. This is how we're going to try it. And if it doesn't work out to this degree by this date, we're going to stop doing this. Like, yeah, setting defined, define processes around trying and failing you're like oh that sounds like a good idea let's give that a try and then like okay four or five months later like is this working or not and should we you know pull out of this and and all of that and yeah um i would say that was the one thing that we would we would definitely change because you make these investments and, and then you're committed to these things and getting out of them is harder um and then i would say putting a whole lot more effort and time into the, the front end of the hiring process, like putting people more through their paces before we, we brought them on. Um, most startups have high attrition rates um, and that's a, that can be a very good thing. Um, but, you know, just investing more money, and, and listen, a high attrition rate is hard because it, it, it was a small team. Things change a lot. I would have, uh, hired differently and fired faster. Um, but overall we had at the end, I mean, I, we were, because we had made so many mistakes. Um, we, I was thrilled with the team we, you know, we exited with and, but yeah, like it was, it was a journey to get there for sure. How did you guys find your first customer? That's my favorite question, obviously, on this chat. But do you remember that exact first transaction? And did you make it before you opened up shop and you were like a legit company with a legit logo? Or at what point did you actually close that? No, we, we definitely made the, the, the after we were a legit company. I would say, you know, the first customer for the consumer business was a download. And then right. the first customer... Um, and the enterprise business was really big, yeah, uh, and mainly because we we had a long standing relationship with them. You know, you when you sell either media or software to companies for a long time, you know, your relationships are what really truly matter. So it's it's calling friendlies, yeah. um, but also I mean, like most of our best customers were cold calls, and, and you know, those first customers were your you're, you know, you're doing the lead gen, you're doing the qualifying, you're doing the AE work and you're doing the proposal. And then when you sign the customer, you're doing the onboarding and service work. Um, you know, so you can understand as, as someone who leads the business, what the points of friction are and, and how much labor you need along the way. Um, so yeah, the first customers were a bunch of friendlies and listen, some of them worked out great and some of them were horrible. Um, I'd say in the first six months, we had probably a 50% attrition rate of customers just because we, we under delivered the product. Um, we had engineering issues. We had a ton of engineering issues that, that ended up plaguing us for a while. 
Um, but we just kept failing forward. Right. So you're like, uh, you know, let's, let's get up and go again. And, and, um, yeah, so I would say first customers are, you're also, here's the, here's the other thing about first customers. If you over deliver your product for your first customer, you're going to fail. If you under deliver your product for your first customer, you're going to fail. Um, how you sell a first customer is I think you have to be very clear with them. I, I don't believe in giving stuff away for free. Um, because when you give away stuff for free, that customer doesn't really commit to giving a shit about that product. So it's like, listen, you give me a dollar and, and I rather take a dollar from you than take, you know, $10,000 from you. Cause I know you're committed and saying to that first customer, Hey, listen, you're, you're some of our first customers. Uh, we're going to give this to you. Here's what the commitment is. We want a case study. Those are critical. And we should also know that like, Hey, this product is only going to get as good as your feedback. So, you know, if you, if you think this product sucks, uh, it's going to continue to suck until you tell me the things that are going to make it suck less. Yeah. But in enterprise now, because competition is so high, particularly in, in enterprise marketing products, and it's a crowded space, if you don't have that engineer talking to that customer. So if you're an engineer and you work at a company that I run, if you're unwilling to talk to a customer, you're not going to work there. Um, so if, you're, if you don't have engineers talking directly to customers and call it your first 12 months, right. minimum 12 to 24 months, like they shouldn't work at your business. Um, and because the speed at which you need to iterate uh, and the quality that which you need to build at these days, given the competition, is just so high. Like you don't have – it's almost like Formula One. Like winning is the only thing that matters, and if you're not winning, get lost. Um, yeah. Do you have a personal philosophy with regards to the importance of being customer-centric? So as a CEO, you just made a very clear statement. If you're an engineer and you're brought on the team and you're not customer-facing – when you're building the product, executing that roadmap, like get going, we don't want you here. What, what, can, you, can you maybe further your mantra or your philosophy a little bit as it relates to customer centricity? Yeah, I think, listen, businesses are driven by customers. And so uh, if you are not customer centric, you're, you're likely not going to be you know, uh, in business for very long unless you have a monopoly like a Facebook or a Google. Facebook and Google can cannot be e customer centric for their B2B customers because they're going to have users regardless and they have monopolies. Right. So Mm -hmm. you don't need to be customer centric. Um, uh, the customer is the only an enterprise, the customer is the only thing that matters. And so if every aspect of your organization isn't customer centric, you're, you're going to not be as successful or you're going to have points of failure. Um, the my philosophy on it is a is a stolen uh, as you know good artist bar great artist steal from a gentleman named David Cancel, who uh, started a company called Drift. I think he's on his fifth startup. He's a phenomenal human being just as an individual, um, and as a business leader, I admire him deeply. Um, and he's a he's a very he's a good friend, and so uh, I, I would say that. My customer centricity is is on a tactical and practical level driven uh, from him, and then the other is I, I like Jeff Bezos. Jeff Bezos is viciously ruthless about his customer centricity, so I would say I'm a hybrid of stealing from uh, him and and um, Bezos and David Cancel, and then I would say also like John Chambers writes a lot about uh, who is also a friend who's a phenomenal human being. Uh, writes a lot about like how you orient every aspect of your institution around the customer and um, you, you know, whether it's the accounting person or the engineer or the marketer or the salesperson, like how do you get those people as close to the customer as possible and understanding and empathizing with the customer because at the end of the day, software is great, but these are all human problems you're trying to solve. Um, so, you know. Yeah. You had gone to 300 events 
uh, 300 business conferences at the time that you started Summit Sync. So you had deep domain knowledge just as a user, right? You had been to the trade shows, you had experienced the pain points of getting in front of the right prospects, optimizing those meetings, figuring out where your ideal customers actually are in the first place, all that stuff, right? Um, you know, there's, I think most people would say it's better to start a business when you have close proximity to the problem. You also hear it a little bit on the other side of things too. Oh, coming at it with no baggage, with fresh eyes, fresh perspective, no biases. What are your thoughts in terms of if you would have tried to start this business without having gone to those 300 trade shows? Let's say you only went to five trade shows and you still recognize the same problem. What would you say your likely success rate might have been? I have no idea. Um, so I think there is a there is a case to be made for um, starting businesses where you have domain expertise. Uh, for example, like Elizabeth Holmes is a great example. Uh, Theranos, like no domain expertise and uh, tried to drive too many aspects of that business that she was not an expert in and, and, and then committed fraud and that led to failure and blah, 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 blah. Um, I think there is, if you under, if you're continuously studying and understanding the problem and understanding the user and the customer, you can lead and drive a business in, in a set of products uh, in a meaningful and valuable way. But there, if you haven't worked in that business for a very long time, uh, or just aspects of that business, like, and you're unwilling to hire the domain expertise to own that aspect of it, you're going to fail. And, and that comes down to, I think a lot of personality of leadership of like, Hey, are you someone who's got a really big ego and are insecure and you're unwilling to you know, admit like, this isn't my thing. And I'm not going to, I don't Salesforce, for example, like I'm never going to be a Salesforce administrator. I don't want to be a Salesforce administrator. I don't want to understand the API integration protocol, all their security, any of that stuff. I could care less. Yeah. However, I know it's really valuable to the products and the services that I deliver. So I need to know enough about it to set a strategy, set a value prop, they build a product that serves an end user, but I'm going to go find the person who just is obsessed with being a Salesforce administrator and integrating, uh, you know, the products that we build in Salesforce. And I'm going to let them run because that person's got five, 10, 20 years experience with that, that platform. And that's their thing. Um, yeah. So I, I would say I have no idea in terms of domain expertise about, um, you know, things of that nature. But I think domain expertise is, is deeply important. Um, I would say at this point, I'm more of a generalist about being a leader, hiring people, managing a team, building a model, understanding a value prop, how to engage investors, how to structure a cap table, um, all of those, type, how to sell a business, <clears throat> um, all of those things versus like, you know, I'm not a domain expert in um, healthcare tech and I don't want to be. So. Yeah. Makes sense. Makes sense. So you might not do a startup in that space for that reason, right? Yeah. And I, listen, I think you doing a startup in my view is you've got to be passionate about the problem, uh, the customers and, um, using the product, right. They use the, I hate this term, but dog fooding, right? Like, the guys at Evernote talked about this. They're like, yeah, we built a bunch of companies previously and that we, we just, and they were, some of them were successful, but we never wanted to use the products that we built because we were bored by them. And so they built Evernote because they wanted to build a product that they wanted to use. Um, I think there's something to that where when times get tough, you're like, Hey, I'm building a product <clears throat> that I want to use to solve my own problem, that's going to see you through tough times where you're just like, fuck this. I'm so annoyed. Uh, like I, you know, I'm selling a product that I don't use. I don't care about all of those things. And, and I would say for the five and a half years, yeah, one, we used our product and two, we were passionate about using it. And we had, 
uh, and we understood in the problem and continued to experience the problem in a very personalized way. So we kept working on it. Agreed. That's awesome. Yeah, it's hard to sleep only two to six hours a night for many nights when you're waking up in the morning and you're not sure why you're doing it, right? If you're not excited about the thing that you're solving, if you're excited about it, if you, you know, I think it's a, I think it's Paul Graham of Y Combinator says something like, you know, if you're not thinking about your business when you're in the shower, like you're not passionate enough about it. So if you're sitting in the shower and you're coming out with eh. ideas. I think I, Paul Graham says that because he wants obsessed founders and to get him a very good return. I would say having slept two to six hours a night for a long, long time, I don't recommend doing that to anybody. That that has real health consequences that I have, have suffered from. Um, so I, I don't recommend doing that. I also think there is a, you need to be able to put it down. Like, um, yeah. and so uh, it also like, Paul Allen's a great example, right? Like Paul Allen helped Microsoft in the kind of like the first several chapters get extremely successful, but he had other interests like music, yachting, um, you know, and he was extremely, extremely successful. So I don't think an obsession of, about your business and product is, is critical for sure, but it doesn't need to be the only thing. Agreed. Uh, when you, so let's talk a bit more about the enterprise sales side. I'd love to talk about the pivots that you guys made through the five-year journey. But talking specifically about that first customer, you mentioned those first few customers all came from relationships, right? And maybe that's one reason why it's good to do something in an industry where you have domain knowledge. It's not just what you know, because you still yeah. have to figure it out from yeah. scratch by talking to customers. But the fact that you have the connections probably allows you to, you know, I, I guess it's both ways, right? You mentioned some of your best deals were cold calls, but how did you get the first few in the door before you did the cold calls? You did the warm calls first, right? And that's where you're able to close some of your deals. Yeah. I think you call friends and like most of the people who have been my customers over the year, like I, I years, I care about them as people. I want to see them advance in their careers and be successful, whether they're buying software or or media or whatever for me, right? You're like, hey, I, I want to see you do well. Um, and so you can call those people who you're friends with and say, listen, I've started this business. We've built this product. Here's the value prop. It would mean a lot for me. It would mean a lot to me if you uh, gave this a try and, and there needs to be some financial commitment there. And it's just a very direct and honest conversation. I would say, you know, if you're an, a product person or an engineer starting a business today and you want to lead that business and you want to lead that business in the long term, you got to be able to sell stuff. You got to be able to talk to human beings and you have to be able to be willing to get rejected and to, and to people to say no, because if you're not, you're never going to raise money and you're never going to sell stuff. And so um, unless you can build a, unless you're a world-class product person an engineer who can build a product that, a human even in consumer and consumers where humans have to talk to other humans like if you can do that that's incredible and but they're rare that's very rare um so you know and if you want to scale it you have to be able to lead and set vision and talk to folks so you know building relationships with other humans no matter what job you're in uh, is really important and really something that matters. And I would say of the things I'm most passionate about, that's it. Like I, I like people, I like listening to their stories. Um, I like being able to be helpful to them or being honest with them and saying, Hey, I can't, I can't help you, but here's what I, here's my suggestion. Um, so yeah, I would say that's a critical element for being a good founder. I just wanted to share my screen for a moment because like watching you give your pitch um, and I'll share a link to this in the actual description, but watching you give this pitch, this six minute pitch you did the ERA pitch in 2017, like it was just so stupidly obvious how passionate you were. The only thing you missed from this was a mic drop at the end, John, just because Thank you, you absolutely crushed the pitch. It was so obvious that you knew what you were doing, that you were getting traction I felt like I wasn't all that good on that pitch. And, uh, and I think I had over, I, I remember I counted 
Yeah, I practiced that like 63 times. And I think I practiced it a little too much. And I had, uh, I didn't sleep the night before. And, and I was very nervous. But now I can get up and do that. And we, we raised quite a bit of money on, off of that. And we got some, we got great customers. And, yeah. uh, but I would say if, to unpack the pitch piece a little bit, yeah. there are three kind of core elements of a pitch, right? It's uh, what you're going to show what you're going to say and your delivery, right? So it's what's the script, what are the visuals uh, and the sound and the show piece, and then how you're going to deliver it, like your demeanor and, and all of those things. And that's the, the, what I call the stage acting piece of it. Right. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, no, I thought it was like, honestly, I'm, I'm going to promote it because although you might look at it and say, oh, it's not perfect you had all three of those elements there. Like you made the company look really good. You said it all in a very eloquent way. And just your stage presence, you're cracking jokes about, uh, about an airline there being unreliable for passenger travel. So I just thought it was really, really cool. And again, when I see that, I'm not surprised that you were able to raise money off of it. I'm not surprised to see, you know, I see that and I see all the businesses that you were leading BD in before you got onto that stage. That's what I see because I can't just go up and deliver it at that level. I would need a lot of luck and a lot of help with the slides, but you probably just, like you said, you practiced it, but that's just what you've become after being an entrepreneur for so long. Yeah. And I would say too, like, Oh, we had a shit ton of help on, on at that stage. We had a lot of help from people who helped on the visuals, people who helped on the, the stage acting, people who helped on the script. Um, and we workshopped it and workshopped it and workshopped it. It was almost like a writer's room. Did yeah. you have people script your, like even were your jokes scripted or were yeah. you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you practice those in front of a mirror for timing and, and all of those things. And um, there's, a, there's a great, I would recommend a couple things for folks. One, there's an organization called Toastmasters that's, been around for a long time and and if you're afraid of talking in front of people uh that's a great organization and then the other book is um how to write like churchill and speak like lincoln or i can't remember the title but we'll check it out no i think if you're if you're the ceo of a business there's a couple of things that are really critical is like one is uh over communicating with your team and your investors and your customers uh, and being clear and articulate and asking the question, how are they hearing me and seeing me? Um, I know I've tried, failed at a billion times and my co-founder is gifted at giving the other side of the perspective. Um, and the other is uh, public speaking because you're going to have to publicly speak internally and you're going to have to publicly speak externally. And so it's a, it's a constant crafting and I would say I've gotten better, but I'm, and I'm good, but I'm not great. And there's, you can tell the difference between good and great. And that's just repetition, right? Yeah. So that's just, you know, you don't get better at stuff until you practice it. And that is just get up and do it. Makes total sense. Hey, that's one of the reasons why I wanted to start this kind of podcast. Just more time to practice, more chance to hone skills, learning how to run a uh, video interview. Honestly, it's been a fascinating experience at the beginning, just trying to balance, like, how do I be in the moment in the podcast and also be aware of the agenda and the flow of the agenda? Honestly, I'm trying to get better every one. Every one I'm doing, I'm like, oh, that was a little bit more natural and authentic or holy smokes, my background looked a little cheesy on that one. So it's, you only get it though through practice. So um, yeah, it's, it's an iterative process, right? In you. Yeah. 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 Uh, building, building summit sync without your enterprise sales background. Could you have done it? Yeah, I think so. I think, um, I don't think we would have had as much success. Um, but I, you know, I've looked at friends that, you know, we got a ton of friends who, who started companies who, who know nothing about enterprise sales, uh, who've crushed it because, they were just not like they were just too naive to know what they were doing. And they, you know, they just walked in and had a good product and a good pitch. And, you know, they, they just didn't know what they didn't know. And they got lucky anyway. 
Um, so I think there's an element of that. I've watched one really close friend do that. Uh, and it's, it's a joy to watch and I refuse to coach him because he's just, he's having too much success on his own. Um, <laughs> and then there are folks who basically say, Hey, I don't know how to do this. Yeah. They give it a try. And they're like, okay, you know, what elements? And then they go seek professional help from either someone who's been doing it like me, who they hire or, uh, you know, they, they kind of build their, their, their legs and their capabilities uh, through trial and error and, and research and talking to friends and, and all those things. It, and to be quite frank about it, enterprise sales is not rocket science by any stretch of the imagination. Um, you know, it's, it, there are a lot of books. There are a lot of uh, gurus. There are a lot of folks out there who can help you not only set up um, your process, but also, you know, how you think about, um, just going to market and all those things. Like the wonderful thing about the startup space is there and, and enterprise sales is people like to talk about it. It's a, it's a, it's a category and an, an area of career that has a lot of content. Cause people spend a lot of time involved, I guess, in building these relationships. My favorite thing about enterprise selling as compared to non-enterprise selling is just the, just the ARR, the, the, the customer lifetime value per se is higher. So you can afford to invest more time in building those relationships. You know, you have your BDRs, you have your account executives, you can't invest a lot of time if your, you know, if your annual reoccurring revenue off that customer is a thousand bucks, if it's 10,000 bucks, you can afford to have, you know, you can afford to invest in the relationship. For me, that suits my personality more. And I guess, like, I think these are some decisions founders should think about when they do start a company. Do you like investing in the relationship? Do you like doing that? Because if you have customers that are $10,000 plus, like, that's a part of the sale, is it not? Yeah, and I would say this too. Like, when I look at big enterprise sales organizations that I, I personally admire or steal from in terms right. of tactics, uh, you know, Oracle, Salesforce, Mark Benioff, Larry Ellison. Um, when I, t when you talk to those folks and, and some of the folks at Facebook who manage the bigger accounts, they, they do a couple things. One is they speak the language of their customer. Yeah. Uh, and also they know their customer's business. They're reading a 10 K they're reading an annual report. They're following an investor call. They're following the news on a, on a deep basis. They know the product lines. They know the leadership. They know where the organization is going they almost know more about their customer's business than they do about their own product. Mm. And those organizations are set up that way where it's, Hey, you as the account owner actually knows more about, you know, call it Samsung. than you know about Oracle's marketing products because you can then bring in Oracle product marketing specialists to, to sell once you have put it in context of their business. Once so, you know really truly gifted enterprise salespeople are one have curious minds are relationship driven and have this overwhelming knowledge of their customer and and they are basically an extension of their customer to say hey i'm not only looking out for my business interest because i'm selling you a product and a service but i'm looking out for your business interests to one, defend my account, and two, like help you along the way, so I'm consultative. Uh, and that only really works in big customers, like transactional stuff that doesn't work that way. Like if you're selling me DocuSign, do, you know, does it integrate with Salesforce and all my other stuff? And it's a, more of a transactional deal. Yeah, I hear that. You've done a pricing model, as I understand it, where actually your price has gone down over time, not up. Um, is, is that true? And how have you, so you said earlier on that you were really adamant on charging. You didn't want to give something away for free because that attracts the wrong kind of buyer. It sets the wrong kind of expectation, right? Um, so you set a price tag on it and for these deals, you've actually gone down in price as opposed to up due to efficiencies, I'm sure, and all kinds of stuff. How did you decide on what to charge at the beginning? Was there, was there ever any pushback? Oh yeah. I mean, we went through, I don't know, nine or 11 different pricing scenarios. Like, um, 
pricing is a pricing to figure out in the early days is brutal. And the problem is pricing leads to forecasting, forecasting leads to expectations. And listen, if you're a startup and you miss your forecast by 50%, I, th- I think that's a good day. Um, I, I investors who think in the first kind of like two to three years of a business that any forecast is, if you, if you hit any forecast, you did something wrong. Um, so the, um, you know, pricing, I think is an, ex, is the thing that would have saved us a lot of time is like, uh, spending more time to study pricing and study and talk to the customers up front about, Hey, how they think about it. And finally, when we did that, which was so obvious, um, it was this combination of seat based and cut and, and consumption based pricing. So it was a hybrid model, which, uh, I think a lot of, you know, organizations like Slack are going to, or have gone to and, um, other companies, right. Where it's less seat based. So we had a really interesting set of dynamics where, you've got, you know, you've got 10 people that are going to trade shows and conferences, but they're not going to every one of them. Right. So we did an annual seat license for the enterprise to set up the account, store the data, all that fun stuff. And, and depending on what level of customer you were, that was uh, a small dollar or a big dollar. Right. And then it was consumption based pricing where it's a hundred dollars per person per event. So if you go to three events, it's 300 bucks. If you go to eight events, it's $800. But if you only go to one event, it's, it's a hundred bucks. So, and then we basically, you know, amortize that over 12 months. Um, and, and you paid based on that. And then there was, if you needed to consume more, if you, if you heard certain hit certain triggers, you got discounts on pricing and all that, which you have to figure your pricing also ties to your accounting and revenue recognition, particularly in SAS of how you have a deferred revenue account that sits on the balance sheet and how you pull that balance, that balance sheet dollars down into the income statement and all that fun stuff. So pricing is a, is a very complex program. Um, and then it gets into forecasting and modeling and FPNA and 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 all that. Um, yeah. Heard it, it's so simple. Like you, like you said, did you literally ask the customers, how do they think about pricing? Was it that not the first nine, not the first nine times, but probably the 10th. Yeah. Um, you know, it was a combination of like surveying customers and all that. And our pricing uh, went down over time, but our accounts got huge. Right. Um, right. So, you know, and now, unfortunately, you know, given the state of the world and COVID, like there's trade shows and business conferences aren't happening. Um, so the... I visited at the right time. That was my first reaction when I saw yeah, it. Yeah, I, I would tell you this, like I, I, I would say we got more lucky than good, but I'm I'm, I'm fine with that. Um, <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So, you uh, know, cool. exited uh, in the event space in 2020, right before co like weeks before COVID deal. I'll yeah. Take yeah, exactly. Um, the partnerships that you've had along the way, it seems like strategic partnerships have been the name of the game in terms of you guys having a partnership with Microsoft, you guys having a Salesforce integration, um, you guys had a number of other types of partnerships that all seem strategic. What's your mindset and philosophy on partnerships? How much did they help you grow? I understand you guys had a pretty small team in house, like relative to how much money you guys are making, you were a team of what, 35, somewhere mid 2019. Maybe you guys were under 50 when you were acquired, but you also had partnerships that allowed you to leverage some some resources as well. How important were partners? Yeah, I think so. Depending on, uh, we had a model where we had a lot of, so in terms of our employee base, so W2 employees, and then we had a ton of contract partners, like, uh, you know, contracting a BDR, contracting a big BDR shop or a big content marketing partner, or, uh, like just kind of how you put the hubs and spokes together. I would say have to, having to do it all over again. Um, and a lot of this was dictated by our, our financing partner. Um, I would have rather internalized and been a bigger organization. Mm-hmm. Um, it, and it, it goes to two things. It goes to, are you building a company to be sold or are you building a company to be a company? Um, and I would say we built a product company. 
uh, we didn't build a company, we built a product company. And that product company was built to go fast, to scale, um, but it was, but over the long term, you know, 10, 20, 30 years, it was not built to be a standalone business. And so, and we knew that and we recognized that. So we, we made decisions totally differently about uh, labor and investing and, and all of those things and, and um, durability and dexterity. I would say if I had to do it again, I would build very differently. Um, you have to think, you know, are you building a, a feature? Are you building a product? Are you building a company? Uh, we built the product and, and it started out as very much a feature and that feature became product and a set of products, but over, but I, we didn't see a path towards, uh, you know, becoming a standalone massive business with multiple products and divisions and all of those things. And if you're going to build multiple and you can get to those things there, there's a path to that, but, um, you know, we, I would say we, we got very good at the product chapter, but we didn't make it to the company chapter. Very interesting. What was the process of actually developing the product? So you always start with something, let's call it the MVP, the minimum viable product, and you constantly improve it. Um, how did you iterate that? Did you, did you build a minimum viable product on the enterprise side? and then go and find a, your first three enterprise customers, listen to their feedback, and then edit, you know, revise your roadmap, and then keep going? Or how did you stage the early, the early points of touch with the product? Yeah, I would say we definitely screwed that up. We built a product with a ton. Of, the first product we built was with a ton of features. Um, and we threw the kitchen sink at it and then went to customers, and they were like, they didn't use half the stuff. So we're like, all right. And the stuff that we thought they were going to use a ton of, they didn't use that. And the th things that like, it was the absolute opposite of what we thought. So we're like, okay, that was dumb. Um, so I, it, the philosophy that we eventually landed on, which we stole from other people that worked really well, turns out um, because they had done this as well uh, is pair a designer, a product person and engineer together and a salesperson and basically go get all four of them to go talk to a customer. So the designer designs a mock-up, shows it to the customer in Envision, they play with it, and the product person drives that conversation along with the salesperson and the engineer basically says, okay, I can build this set of features this quickly. And that's how you basically build one set of features. And then you look for patterns, right? So it usually is between 10 and 20 folks that you wanna to talk to, have that group of four people like, Hey, you have an idea, you build that into Envision, you go show that to a customer with those four folks on the phone and see how fast you can actually deliver those features. And that's, you, you stair-step that process, right? So I'd say that's kind of how you do it. But also you need to have a philosophy of, are we starting at the problem or starting at the solution? So uh, I think we, we started at the solution because we felt we knew the problem well enough Turns out we should have started the problem, the problem, and basically said, "Okay, um, you know, let's solve little aspects of this problem over time, um, until until that adds up to solving the overall problem." Versus like, "Hey, we delivered a solution because we thought we knew what that solution was the problem." Uh, and so I would say, start at the problem, and then you know, iterate in in a team of four that basically goes out and says, okay, I've mocked it up. Does the guy who, does the engineer and the designer agree that what's been mocked up can be built along with the product person? The salesperson brings in the, the conversation and drives it, but the product person kind of rides shotgun with them and the engineer is listening in to say, okay, what, what, what's the time frame of this going to build? And the designer is iterating over time. So that's kind of the pod that I would say, you know, if I was going to start a startup from scratch today, the first four hires, I would, you know, I could be the salesperson and I'd hire a product person, a designer, and an engineer, a full stack engineer. Yeah. Uh, and if you're really bootstrapping and you're in your early stages of entrepreneurship and you need to be three of those things, let's say at the same time, probably you don't have to be all four, but Hey, 
there are unique circumstances. But if you got to be a few of those things at the same time, do you think that's possible to wear? Like, do you yeah, that's 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 a unique person for sure. Uh, I I can be a product person. Um, I can't be an engineer. I can't be a designer. So, you know, I definitely if if you had to pare it down, um, you know, I I can be a product person. I'm obviously a salesperson. Um, so I would find a co-founder who is a engineer and a designer and, and those there's overlapping skills there. So I, I think to find someone with all four of those skills is, you know, they exist. Uh, but that's a super, super unique individual. Yeah, I would be more specific there. Let's see if you agree, but don't just find an engineer with design skills or whatnot, but find an engineer that is customer centric because from my experience, just because you find a smart person that's really good at something doesn't mean that they're great at, you know, doesn't mean that they have the desire or the interest or the skill set to listen to the customer. And I've seen too many times where you have a talented engineer that doesn't want to go to the meetings with the customer that wants to, you know, yeah, that person doesn't work for me. Yeah. Yeah. That person doesn't. And like, yeah. unless you, in, 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 unless you are Steve jobs and that is rare and Steve jobs wasn't, asshole uh you can't be you know you can't be that guy um you you are right um you know and then, so this leads to a, an interesting topic right where it's like your first 15 hires have to be multi-discipline right like i'm i'm hiring only the exceptional people like you're here because you're exceptional and i'm paying you if in the economic opportunity I'm presenting to you is an exceptional opportunity that, and I've put you through your paces to prove that you're exceptional and that I'm demanding of you, your, your incredible talents every single day to drive this forward. And you have to be a, a multiple, multiple disciplined operator in your first 15 hires. You can, I think after that hire for people who are very specific to their one task and they are exceptional in, in doing that task. But in your first 15 folks, like I need that person to be a, a, a ninja. Um, yeah, maybe take the person that's less smart in one particular area and someone that just can cover a number of things and knows how to think about those number of things too, right? Yeah. Yeah. You guys pivoted a lot. And I think that's one of my favorite things about this story from you know like you guys started like i remember meeting you guys so i met you through an introduction from mk marsden we yeah. were out in a bar in, in Spain. exactly yeah. we were at mobile world congress and i remember texting back and forth with you just excited that my this is the first time i traveled internationally and i was able to use my my local phone number yeah, internationally. So I was all excited that I was operating like I was at my at my home kitchen, and uh, and we met up. And I I must say today I'm still really grateful that Summit Sync was willing to be you know willing to be a guinea pig and try a product that we were looking to commercialize as standalone IP. We had an analytics a mobile app analytics product that our software consultancy built. Summit Sync was one of our early adopters. You guys no. try it, use it. Um, probably one of the reasons it didn't succeed, in my mind, very clearly, is as much as I love the visionary of the product and the lead engineer, he had no time to spend customer facing. So it was me as the sales and BD guy who was trying to extract feedback from customers. We just didn't have the right philosophy. We didn't have the right mentality to succeed. We we're a little bit late with our analytics product, but like we needed to have that team of four people represented, at least in mindset, and we didn't. But hey, I was grateful that you guys tried it out, and that's how I got to know you guys. Yeah, well, listen, and we're grateful that you were we were able to use the product, and I know it worked well for us. And yeah, and like, listen, I would say. Um, one, that philosophy that I share with you is not mine. I stole that from somebody, <laughs> David Cancel particularly. And, um, you know, it, it, it takes years to get to these places. And it's also like you can now, and I imagine you have a very similar experience, is that you can look at these things and the dynamics of a startup or a team and say, 
you know, this is going to fail. Like you have the greatest product in the world, but if your team is not on the same page, I was a rower in college. Cool. And so I rode on a division one top 10 in the country team. I was a walk on and I was very fortunate to be on this team, but you could tell if like I sat the, the three seat or the six seat and you could tell if the guy two seats behind you was having a bad day because, and, and not just like bad day physically, like rowing wise, like, he was pissed off about something or he was mentally or emotionally just not there. And that guy wasn't on the same page and we went slower because of it. And you could just tell that. Um, and it's the same thing when you get to this level with startups is that when you do this for a while and you've had the only way you learn is failure, uh, success is a horrible teacher. And, um, you know, so you, uh, you get to this place where you're like, all right, I can, I can get in the boat and I can look around and I can say, no, nah, I'm not going to work because we're not on the same page. And that guy, that guy or girl is, is off philosophically or they're just not, they're not where we are and you're not going to go as fast. Yeah. Well, like one theme that we're talking about a lot is like mistakes and fuck ups. And the interesting thing is you and I can both look back on our different startup experiences as founders And we can so easily see like, we did this wrong. Like that was ridiculous. Like, of course, now I know better, but we're still going to make a plethora of mistakes the next time. Right. It's like, it doesn't mean that just because you learn like X number of lessons, you don't finish learning from the failures and then succeed in the next one. It's like every circumstance is different. I'm sure I'm going to make some different kind of screw up on the next one. But I, I do believe that you get smarter as you go. You just realize like, yeah, that is not a good co-founder. That is not a good customer champion. Uh, this is not a good you know, situation to be in. No, we're not going to do that feature for so-and-so. You just figure that out. And, uh, and then I guess your odds of success go up. And I guess this is why investors will look more fondly upon you if, if you've had a success story. Or more importantly, if you've had a couple failures, why you're still investable, right? Yeah, I would I would say most most real professional investors uh, are would prefer to invest in a guy on his first first time failure, second time company. Yeah, I've seen this a lot, and um, you know, uh, and 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 I might be this. You never know. So like, you know, you have a successful exit the first time, and then the second time you just fuck it up because it's like there's an overconfidence or, or there's a, Hey, they, they, they hit it great once they're going to hit it great again. Um, so because we're in COVID-19, I just tainted my girlfriend's eyelashes. Like I painted her eyelashes and the first time I did it, I was scared shitless, but I did a perfect job. I, I did it. I didn't get any of the, uh, the chemical taint on the skin of her eyes. I got it pure on the eyelash. Second time, what do you think happened? I fucked it up real bad. And she had like chemical reaction pain. And I told her like in a nice way, but not in a way that she could digest. Like, sweetie, this needed to happen. Like I succeeded the first time by luck. Now that I know what not to do, I'll be much better on time number three. So Yeah, and and that's a that's a repetition and practice thing too. So, you know. (laughs) <laughs> bold move bold move uh, I mean, when, when she opened her eyes in the mirror and she looked like she just got punched in both eyes or didn't sleep in two weeks i knew that i was in trouble it, it didn't help that it was her birthday either yeah that's not that's not a good day <laughs> so uh, both the pivots like did the product pivot or did just the message pivot from when you guys started no with- the product definitely pivoted like we we cut and this took us way too long like we, there was no path to, to revenue or sustainable growth economics. And, and that took us way too long to figure out on the consumer product and then pivoting from the consumer product to the enterprise product should have been faster. Um, and like once we finally figured out the enterprise product, which took a minute, um, we just scaled. Um, and so, um, the yeah i would say pivots suck they always happen 
they never happen as fast as you want. And, you know, I, I would say if, uh, the whole product, the message, like we, we literally just wiped the whole thing clean and started over, um, which was scary and painful. And, uh, it usually, you know, we, we had to let go of a lot of friends and, and all those things and, and uh, you know, tell that you, you have to admit failure. Um, but I think that should have happened way faster. How would uh, you go faster? Like what, what should you have noticed or done so that you could have made a faster decision on the pivot? Change, change leader, change who was leading and managing uh, what aspects of the business mm-hmm. is like first. And second is like setting, setting like time frames. like, Hey, in this period of time, we will be here. And if we will do X, this is how, this is why, this is when, and we will be here on this date. And if we're not here on this date, we're going to take drastic actions and we're going to either let people go or we're going to shutter this product. Uh, defining, defining A to B uh, in, in a time frame is, is critical. Like we, we took way too long to do that. But like, that's again, you know, it was our first time out. We thought we knew what we were doing and, uh, that was our first mistake, but yeah, just like, okay, we're going to achieve. So we've got even like some of the, the things that Al and I are playing with, like ideas wise, we're like, okay, in this 30 days, here's what we're going to learn. Here's why we're going to learn it. And here's what go, no go looks like. And at the end of 30 days, we got to say yes or no. And here's the evidence of data. And we've said, we've done this twice now. And we've, we've said no at the end of it, because you basically said, Hey, I don't have enough conviction or I haven't seen enough success or any of that stuff. So you're like, cool, I'm not going to invest any more time or resources in that. And I think you just be very candid with, with folks of like, you're going to get to this place in this time. And if you don't, you're not going to be here and we're not going to continue to invest the resources uh, in this initiative or this product or this feature yeah. to continue to do that. I feel like one thing that would make that difficult is if you already have a couple customers, you have a bunch of users, it's one thing if you have a clean slate, right? But if you have people that you're going to disappoint that are currently benefiting from your solution, how do you have that conversation and tell them like, well, if that's the case, then you're having success and you're, and you have to say, okay, can based on, based on how much they're paying me and how much time it took to get them, and how many more of them there possibly are and how much resources I have to reach out to them. Is there a business here? And if there's not, you say that those two customers, Hey, listen, there's not a business here. We're going to support you over this period of time until this is going to go away because we need to change the focus of our business. Um, but if you've got hundreds of customers or thousands of customers or, you know, you're ha- that's, then you're having success and then those metrics are there. So you continue to invest. Um, but yeah, I would say that, that, you know, uh, or you're like, all right, we, you know, what's the, what's the next set of resources that we invest in this? Yeah. Makes sense. It seems like sometimes if you have the wrong first customer and you're solving it the, the incorrect way, like if you have a customer and it's not your ideal customer profile, and then you realize afterwards that the problems that you're solving for them are different than the problems that you want to be solving for other customers at scale. Is there a point there where you should consider abandoning a first customer or like, Yeah, well, I I think it's like, Hey, listen, if that first customer, if that first customer leads you to a place of solving problems that are valid and real and that they're, they're paying for and that other customers are willing to pay for as well, you're like, all right, my assumptions were wrong. My customer wasn't. So uh, you're like, my customer's right. It's a question of, can I find a lot more of those customers and, uh, you know, get them to buy stuff and use stuff, buying, using, buying and using are the only things that matter. So, you know, where, wherever your assumptions are, what you want to build, what you want to build doesn't matter what your customer will buy, use and buy will matters. Yeah. yeah. In terms of how the, how to for enterprise sales, let's say you're starting from scratch you have some kind of minimum viable product that you believe is sufficient or can be quickly made sufficient. And let's say you're trying to get some enterprise sales. I know this enterprise sales word, I know I'm jazzing it up, but you want sales that have more than a nominal value per year, right? 
Yep. What would you say is the is the best approach for finding this type of customer? Do you think that you should like write down a list of your 100 dream customers, go and cold call them and, you know, see if you can close three to five? Or what would you say is like a pretty cool approach starting from scratch Zippo from the customer perspective? Well, and that's a good exercise because um, it visualizes who you want to sell to. And also it's a good way to communicate to others what your priorities are. Right. Um, so I'd say like write down, yeah, your list of, I, I think it's more like 10. Because that a hundred is hard to manage. Ten is easier to manage. A lot of dream. Ten customers. are your here. Are my first here would be my, if I had my first ten ideal customers. Here's what they are. Then call them. That and also like I would do a second list of like, hey, who do I know? Like on my LinkedIn, like or or my phone book. Who could I who could I call, and get to actually buy stuff. Um, so. That is um, who I would, what I would do. Like, where, where are my relationships? Who do I know? And, and can they be a customer? And what are my 10 ideal customers? I'd work off those two lists. Yeah. And just call those people and, or email them or both. Um, and, you know, articulate your value prop, be honest, and, and write down all their, uh, their criticisms and their feedback and, while they're, why they're telling you no or who they need to get to say yes and all that. It's basically just a mystery game. You're like, all right, you know, how do I keep, how do I keep playing this game? Yeah, that's true. If I broaden this up, not just to enterprise sales, but just finding a first customer in general, what's your advice to the entrepreneur out there that asks the question, how do I find my first customer? How do I, you find your first customer? I mean, it all depends on like who the user is, right? You're like, you know, I think finding your first customer is, is inherently tied to your, um, who the, what the product is you're building. Like who, who's finding your first customer is who's the product solving, like what problem, who's the user that the problem is solving for. Right. So it's like, that's how you find your first customer. I mean, that's a, that is led by your product, not by who you want to sell to. Yeah, love that. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of the First Customer Club, where we help startup founders figure out how to find their first customer, build their first product, and get startup traction. I'm basically building a framework for how to start a startup. I hope that today's episode with John Corrigan provided some tangible tips, tactics, and frameworks for how to actually do it, especially if you're selling to the enterprise as a startup. Once we finally figured the enterprise product out, we just scaled. Now isn't that motivating to hear? Check us out online at www.firstcustomerclub.com, visit our YouTube channel at First Customer Club, follow Luke Bahonicki on LinkedIn for daily startup chatter and to see the episode highlights if you know how to spell my name. And hey, thanks for tuning in to another episode.